Okay. Um, we're recording and I should proceed? Yep. Okay, very, very good. Okay. Um, uh, today is January uh, 13th. I'm presenting um, about async context, um, the, the TC39 proposal presenting to the FRIAM group. Um, the async, async context uh, is a proposal that um, uh, Legenda Cast and Justin Ridgewell are um, bringing to TC39 for addition to JavaScript. Uh, it is uh, in classic language terminology that I'll be explaining today. Uh, it is a form of fluid scoping and it necessarily, uh, to achieve its functionality, breaks the existing object capability rules, but it was written to meet all of the object capability safety concerns, which raises a terrifying question, which is um, the uh, a terrifying question for us, which is uh, we've spent decades coming to appreciate the safety benefits, the security, the, well, security benefits, which is safety plus expressiveness benefits of living within the object capability rules. Uh, so if you weaken the rules, it's very hard to evaluate whether you've lost anything that you really care about. Um, and that's exactly what the question that I want us to be discussing today and I will be making an argument uh, that, uh, in fact, with some explicit qualifications, which I'll uh, be explaining, that we actually don't lose anything uh, and that we gain exactly the expressiveness that uh, is the reason why Justin has been proposing this. Um, okay. So, the best way to understand what Mark, Mark, Mark yeah. can you can you see the raised hands? Oh, I'm sorry. I I don't know. Um, oh, I can. Yes, uh, Kevin. Yeah, uh, just uh, please please include the definition of what fluid scoping is. Okay. Okay. So I I will do that, and I will do that. Um, by putting a piece of code in front of us. Okay. This piece of hardened JavaScript code represents the simplest expression of Justin's API uh, in hardened JavaScript without breaking any rules. Uh, and because it's not breaking any rules, it's also missing a critical part of Justin's desired expressiveness. But this does achieve, this does provide fluid scoping. Uh, so let me explain what it's doing. Um, the I'm going to start, actually, I'm going to start before I explain this code, I'm going, to, I'm going to start with a bit of history. In the history of Lisp languages, uh, starting with McCarthy's Lisp in the late 1950s, uh, Lisps were historically dynamically scoped. All modern languages, including modern Lisps, like Scheme, are lexically scoped. The um, in, in both cases, you can, you can think of the scoping as uh, binding a variable to a value within an interval where the intervals nest so that the shadowing uh, uh, of a variable is the rebinding of the same variable in a nested interval. So in a lexically scoped language, which is you know, what 
all modern programmers now understand, the intervals are textual intervals. Uh, in JavaScript, um, considering only um, blocks and const, uh, the uh, scope interval begins with an open curly and ends with a closed curly. So a const declaration between the curlies brings that variable name into scope in that textual interval, uh, except for any nested textu text textual intervals, any nested blocks in which the same variable is redefined with a different binding. So any use occurrence of a variable, to understand the use occurrence, you have to figure out what the corresponding defining occurrence is. And then that defining occurrence, I'm only talking about const, not let, that defining occurrence binds that variable name to a value in that textual interval. Uh, so the, the lookup is going to the nearest enclosing interval. Dynamic scoping is, um, yeah, Bill. Bill, your hand is raised. Uh, can anybody hear Bill? No, it sounds like his audio is giving him trouble again. Bill, you want to ask a question in chat? I, I can bring up my chat. Do you mean the same name or do you mean the same or something else when you say the same variable? Ah, so in lexical scoping, I mean the same name. And in dynamic scoping, I also mean the same name. But in fluid scoping, I mean something else, which I will be getting to in a moment. Uh, okay, so <laughs> thank that, you. <laughs> yeah, and that is that is exactly the germane question because that's the 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 essence of the shift from dynamic scoping to fluid scoping. Um, so in dynamic scoping, the intervals were not textual, were not static. The intervals were temporal. So the, uh, when you had a use occurrence of a variable, what you did is, what, what the Lisp implementation did is it actually looked backward up the call stack to a caller on the call stack that bound that variable name to a different, to a value. So, uh, and there were nested intervals because the dynamic extent, the temporal extent of a function call is, um, uh, in, uh, uh, is temporally nested by call return. So you looked out for the closest temporally enclosing binding of the variable. Now, the dynamic scoping is as unstructured as it sounds like, and you got into all of the same trouble that by modern eyeballs, you would expect to get into with something that was that anti-modular. Um, so scheme programmers, uh, starting with a purely lexically scoped language, uh, but trying to recover some of the expressive expressivity benefits they associated with dynamic scoping, invented fluid scoping, but they did that within object capability rules. Uh, and the difference between dynamic scoping and fluid scoping uh, uh, is that the, th the thing that we think of as a fluid variable is no longer a variable name. It is now a first class object that you either have a capability to that object or you do not. So in the case of Justin's proposal, uh, Justin, I should say, Justin's code is expressed in more traditional JavaScript with classes. Um, and I'm I've rewritten Justin's um, API using um, Doug Crockford's objects as closure syntax uh, and rewritten it in the style in which um, we favor for hardened JavaScript that's maximally friendly for understanding object capability safety issues. Um, but the, but the, the transition from classes to objects as closures 
uh, is just a, uh, a clarity issue. It doesn't change anything fundamental here. So there is a outer maker that is assumed to be ambiently available and is therefore assumed to be um, uh, uh, immutable and powerless. Uh, and by this definition, in fact, is immutable and powerless. So this maker, make async context, uh, creates and returns a new object, uh, which is an- You, a, you a, pronounced that make async and it's really make sync. I'm sorry, make, it makes sync context. So it produces a new sync context, uh, which has two methods, run and get. And the sync context object, um, each, you know, each sync context instance represents a distinct fluid variable. Um, and in order to read this, so, so the idea is that the variable represented by each instance has a binding over a, temp a temporal context, where the temporal context uh, is delimited by uh, the time between when a function, a called function starts executing and when the called function completes, uh, irrespective of whether it completes with a return, you know, a normal return, or it completes with a thrown exception. So to read the current binding of the fluid variable, one says to the sync context instance invokes its get method, um, and that returns the current state of this encapsulated uh, state variable. Um, and to bind it, the binding uh, operation is this run method on the, I'm just going to call the fluid, the, the sync context instances, I'm just going to refer to them from now on as the fluid variable, where we under, all understand that the variable is a first class object, it is not a name. So the variable, the binding operation on the variable is run that takes a value to be rebound to the variable during a nested temporal interval, CB that stands for callback, and args, which is a list of arguments. Um, the nested temporal interval is the time during which the callback is called with these arguments and the return here inside the try finally says that whatever the outcome is of the callback, uh, that's also uh, the outcome of the call to the run method. So uh, aside from the fluid binding dynamics, aside from that, calling run, you know, calling fluid variable dot run of value comma callback comma args is just like calling the callback with the arguments spread out. Um, the only difference between the two is what it's doing with regard to the binding of the, of the fluid variable context. So what's going on here in the shallow binding implementation of fluid scoping is to rebind the fluid variable over a temporal context, you stack up the previous current binding into this prev variable, prev, um, then you rebind the state variable to, to, the, to the current value that you want over the new temporal, the new nested temporal interval. You do the function call, you, whatever the outcome of the function call is, you make that the outcome of the run, um, uh, but you enclose it in a try finally so that um, uh, before propagating that outcome, you restore state to what, it, to what it was outside the nested temporal interval. Um, and we've all written code like this, including uh, when writing code in object capability languages, uh, one can argue about uh, um, whether this is well structured or badly structured code, whether this is a good abstraction or a bad abstraction, but it's clear 
that it's not breaking any rules. And it's clear that it is expressive, that it is providing us some convenient functionality. Um, now, so is, uh, is kept... callback assumed to have access to this run facet as well? Yes. I'm sorry. No, no, that's it. That's it. That's exactly. Thank you. That was exactly also the... I've interrupted, but two other people have their hands up. Okay. Since I started, since you asked, I'll start, I'll start by answering you, but then let's go through the entire queue before I come back to the presentation. So uh, you asked exactly the right question, which is it is not assumed. It is assumed that it might have access to. It. So that's the critical transition from dynamic scoping to fluid scoping, which is whether you have access to the, to the instance, whether you have access to the fluid variable object itself is simply governed by object capability rules. So if the, if the code in the callback does not have access to it, and if none of the code that it calls has access to it, if transitively nothing that's happening during this interval has access to um, this fluid variable object, then the rebinding was purposeless. Um, however, the, the, the interesting thing is that the callback itself might not have access, but the callback might in turn call something that does have access. So in that case, what's happening is the callback, the callback object, the callback function cannot access the fluid variable binding, but something that it calls can access the current fluid variable binding because it has access to the fluid variable object. Okay, uh, so first of all, Mike, was that clear? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Kevin. Yeah, I just wanted to observe that this is not, this is not strange in that like things like this are an extremely common pattern for you know very sorts of you know logging or 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 um, task execution contexts kind of things and in particular it is often the case that the state cell is actually a thread local variable which makes it so that in that case this 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 one object has a distinct state for every thread that it might be used in, which is slightly different. But you can also imagine, you know, a thread local which points at one of these as a as a piece of global state, which creates one of these for each thread. So, just wanted to say that to relate this to uh, existing patterns. Right, and in fact, where Justin and the and and that team started was uh, the um, with. Uh, Justin, correct me if this is wrong, uh, but started with uh, thread local variables as the inspiration for uh, for this abstraction. Um, yeah, so Node has its own implementation that's very, very similar, or like almost exactly the same thing as a thread local variable. Um, we have a minimized version that Node did um, that eliminates some of the bugs that you can have with a thread local. Um, it's not possible to leak a value with this current design. Uh, whereas with a thread local, it is absolutely possible and it happens constantly. Mm -hmm. When you say leak, do you mean, you know, writing but not restoring? Correct. Um, you enter and then you never exit. And so whatever value you entered with continues to be there, even though your temporal time, your, your callback is finished. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Terry. Yeah, so I, I assume the access to this to this uh, on high fluid variable <laughs> um, could be through static scoping, uh, lexical scoping somewhere else. Yes. Or, yeah. or in fact, it could be passed as one of the arguments to the callback. Is that correct? That is all, all of that is correct. Okay. It is just a first class object in which the access to the object is governed by all of the normal object capability rules. It's just the first class object in the language with no additional constraints beyond the constraints of any other first class object. So we're really falling back on lexical scoping at some level here. Right. Yeah. That's as right. the primary way of, of sharing uh, bindings. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was the key insight in the invention of fluid scoping by the scheme community 
is that the access to the fluid variable was itself governed by lexical scope. Thank you. Okay, Alan. That answered my question. Okay. Uh, uh, Kevin again. Uh, sorry, I forget. Okay, Alan again. Okay, nobody. Nobody. So, okay. Um, so, um, so none of this is surprising so far. Let me now get to the um, the additional primitive that makes this different. That makes this something that uh, is scary from an object capability perspective. Um, so. It should be in five or six. You're looking for the wrap method? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so so I'm going to show five, but, um, but in order to show five, let me make the point uh, by showing, make a point by showing one first. So this code is essentially the code from um, uh, Justin's slide six. Um, and I, uh, uh, it, and you can see it's written in class style, but it's, but other than, you know, cosmetic things like class versus uh, objects as closure, uh, uh, this is, uh, the, the observable semantics of this is exactly the same as what you were seeing. But the way in which it is implemented is different, which is it's implemented uh, in terms of a, shared global variable, uh, this, this outer let, and, and given that sync context is a universally shared primordial, uh, the fact that it closes over mutable state breaks the rules. But the equivalence to the code that we were showing shows that even though it's breaking the rules, it's, um, it has exactly the semantics of something that by construction we know to be safe. Um, uh, then um, the, the, the next one is that um, going from zero to five, this reflects um, uh, Justin's slide 11 plus slide 13, in which this is exactly the same as the as the class code that we were just seeing, except for the renaming of sync context to async context. Uh, and then just in slide 13 adds this wrap method, which is the thing that creates a semantics that cannot be implemented directly within the rules of hardened JavaScript. Well, so, the and and this wrap method is making use of the storage variable. So let me talk through um, uh, conceptually what's going on here without getting too deeply into the specifics of how it's implemented, because I want to shift to uh, an, a new, the implementation I wrote in the last hour that I think makes the semantics clearer and makes the case for safety clear. Um, so the, with these temporal intervals, there's two dimensions that we need to be in the two, yeah, two dimensions that we need to concern about. One dimension is the temporal dimension, and the other dimension is the fluid variable identity, because the binding to a value is the binding of a fluid variable object over an interval of time. So the, the, the value binding is looked up in a, a point in both of those dimensions. The um, global variable here is the thing that's being changed according to the nested intervals of time but this is shared among 
all of the fluid variable objects, all of the instances of async context are sharing the same uh, uh, storage variable, the same, sharing the same global storage variable. So this is only varying with the temporal dimension. Um, so then what RAP does is it's doing the, the um, in the same way that lexical scoping plus closure capture is the thing that makes lexical scoping so powerful. Uh, before Scheme, languages like Algol and Pascal had lexical scoping and had downward closures, but they did not have closures that could outlive the call frame that they were created in, and therefore did not have the expressiveness of objects. It's with Scheme and the dependence of the, the descendants of Scheme that a function created in a lexical scope could outlast the context it was created in. That's called, so we can think of that as closure capture of lexical bindings. What RAP is doing is an analogous closure capture of temporal bindings. Bill. I just wanted to, as a historical note, when we were developing Kikos in the very early days, uh, we were using Algol 68 as a design language. And we very quickly decided that in Algol 68, uh, activation records uh, were not allocated on a stack, they were allocated in a heap. And that made the problems go away. And since we weren't trying to run the code, it wasn't a problem. Yeah, I've actually read, believe it or not, I've actually read the Algol 68 spec, or at least the relevant parts of it. Uh, and I remember being confused about whether in the actual language as specified, not in the, not in the language as implemented, but in the language as specified, whether that was the case. Because the language was allegedly memory safe. There, uh, there was uh, uh, something in the report that said basically you had to do it on a stack. It was very obscure and it was only a sentence or two. But if you do it on a stack, then how do you preserve memory safety if someone holds on to a reference to a deallocated closure? Uh, that is uh, illegal. And I'm not sure how, how they uh, made those references uh, turn into uh, something that, you could, that would cause us an exception. Okay. In Pascal, they were made illegal by a textual, a static rule which is that the variables that could hold on to um, uh, nested functions uh, were not first class and could only be passed downwards. Okay. The, uh, so in any case, so let's take a look. So, so just given the understanding that storage represents the nested temporal context but shared across all fluid variables, we can now understand how RAP does a temporal closure capture. When you call RAP with a function, it creates a new function, the wrapper function, uh, which it returns. Um, and the wrapper function, when it's called, simply calls the original function, again, with the same with the same arguments that you pass to the wrapper wrapper function and inside a try finally with the return so that whatever the outcome is of the function um, aside from fluid scoping considerations whatever the outcome is of the function the wrapper function has the same outcome so the wrapper function is uh, is essentially a behavioral uh, mimic of the wrapped function uh, the difference is that at the time you call wrap, so temporally during the call to wrap, it remembers the temporal context in which wrap was called. And then when the wrapper function is later called, it restores that temporal context. Um, I'm sorry, it restores that it's it, it restores the temporal context over here on line 43 um, uh, calls the function with the restored temp with with having restored the temp temporal context 
uh, in which from which RAP was called, and then um, uh, on exit from this nested interval uh, restores whatever the temporal context was before the wrapper function was called. Um, uh, so at this point, uh, we the the thing that's magical here is that uh, wrap over here is is assumed to be globally pervasively accessible and assumed to be powerless, but what it's manipulating is the uh, is is all of the fluid bindings together in aggregate that the user of RAP does not have access to. So over here, we mentioned that the callback might not have access to a given fluid binding, and if it doesn't have access to the given fluid bind, fluid, sorry, to a given fluid variable, it doesn't have access to the variable, it can neither perceive its current value, nor can it rebind it uh, on a further nested um, context. With wrap, it is still the case that the callback cannot perceive it, but it is the case that a callback by using wrap, which is assumed to be pervasively available, can rebind it without rebind all of the fluid variable bindings without knowing about any of the fluid variables. Um, and to demonstrate that, I think probably the next uh, most informative thing to look at is the attack. Before we do that, Kevin has a question. Yes. Yeah, I, I think this may be like, you know, what you're already talking about, but, you know, my critique, I have a critique of the semantics of this thing, which is that we, we previously said that, you know, the vari the global variable is, you know, equivalent to, you know, it's a bundling together all of these individual set and reset fluent variables. However, by introducing wrap, you have now made it the case that this particular manipulation or rather this particular choice of, of, of a continuity of scope is now shared among all variables. So this implementation in particular is now no longer equivalent to the set and reset implementation. And this is not necessarily bad, but this is something that any user needs to be aware of. That's exactly correct. I, I endorse every single word of what you just said. It might or might not be bad. It's not necessarily bad. That's the question that I'm bringing to the group uh, with an argument that it's not bad, but it is certainly not obviously not bad. Um, uh, it is breaking the OCAP rules. It's doing it in an irreducible manner. Um, it, it, there, you cannot rewrite this as equivalent code within the OCAP rules. Um, uh, and uh, a defender, somebody writing defensive code that does not know about this, uh, can be attacked. In order to write code that, that is successfully defensive, you have to know that you are in a language with these extra primitives and use these extra primitives as part of your defense. Kevin. Yeah, well, you have to use it if you are using these, flu these fluid variables. If you no. are not using them, no, you have to use it if your attacker might be using the fluid variables. Um, sorry, I because wanna the attacker the might be observing the context in which they're called? Yes, and that's the attack I'm about to demonstrate. Just right, but if your code never, you, never cares about the values of any fluent variables by any remove, then it doesn't know. But yes, that could be. Yeah. Right, if it, does, if, it, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't care that others, that the attacker might care. Uh, but the attacker, right. but the attacker can. can uh, so I'm, I'm about to show an attack that that makes this clear, yeah. and it also kind of makes clear how narrow the attack is. Uh, Justin, uh, I wanted to clarify one important part here. Um, the attack that's going to be demonstrated here, uh, and the defense that you have to perform, uh, the, in the defense particularly, you have to know that async context is a thing that exists. You don't have to know about any individual async context instance. Right. Uh, you do not have to have access to all async context. You just have to know that async context exists and use right. wrap defensively. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly correct. It's, it's like 
we have changed the ground rules from OCAP language A to OCAP language B. And if you're in OCAP language B and your attacker is in OCAP language B, then um, uh, when you write defensive code in OCAP language B, if you do it knowing that you're in OCAP language B, uh, then uh, you can be safe. Uh, and you can be safe by OCAP for OCAP concerns, which is why I would argue that OCAP language B is an OCAP language. But the attack that I'm about to show is an attack by on Carol, where Carol is writing defensive code for OCAP language A, while Carol's attackers, um, while Carol and her attackers are actually running in OCAP language B. So the attackers are only succeeding at the attack if Carol doesn't know that she's actually running in OCAP language B and is not succeeding at doing what she needs to defend herself in OCAP language B. And that's all very obscure and be will become clear in a moment as I show the attack code. Uh, were there any other raised hands? No, okay. It's inside async context, yeah. Thank you. And then a, a test attack is the one that's successful. Okay. Um, this is async, which is considerably more difficult to understand because it's promise-based. Oh, 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 thank you. I'm sorry. This is not the one I wanted to look at. It's, uh, yeah, test attack. Yes. Okay. So, the, so Alice and Bob are supposedly, are, are both created by Carol, um, uh, from Alice and Bob's source code, cre assumed created in separate compartments, such that they should have they should be completely isolated from each other, uh, except by communications channels that Carol controls, uh, and that. Um, uh, uh, but Alice and Bob are in cahoots. They're trying to communicate in ways that subverts Carol's safety intentions. Uh, Mike. What is the impediment to implementing the asynchronous um, version using lexical scoping as opposed to a global variable? Uh, the impediment is that since wrap is assumed pervasively available, it must be safe and powerless and immutable. Um, and uh, however, the use of wrap is capturing all of the bindings of a given that, that were present in the temporal context at the time wrap was called and restores all of those bindings during the temporal context in which the um, the um, the wrapper function is called, and there is uh, under the assumption that wrap has no access to mutable state. Uh, there's uh, and that um, uh, and that the, um, the 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 maker of fluid variables likewise has no access uh, to uh, mutable state. Uh, there's there's no way for them to, um, there's no way for wrap to manipulate the, the temporal bindings uh, that, are, that are brought about by use of the fluid variable. Right. I see. So because the fluid variable could be passed in as an argument, if you tried to wrap and use a local wrapping, it would not mask those bindings, right? You need a single global place for all your bindings if you're going to mask right. them. 
Yeah. If 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 all RAP did is it is if RAP took as an additional argument the specific fluid variables that we want whose bindings we wanted the closure to capture, and then it rebound only those during the call to the wrapped function, then again, there would be no magic. Um, and that actually anticipates the new rewrite that I did in the hour before the call. Um, uh, but, but yeah, that's, that, is, uh, that is the case. The, the thing that makes wrap magic is it's, re, is it's capturing all of the fluid bindings, none of which the caller of wrap is assumed to have access to. Was that clear? Yes, except for the motivation of doing that. Why does it need to be able to modify all of them? Why can't it simply introduce a new scope and pass that in as needed? I'll let uh, Justin take that one. Yeah, so imagine you have a, you have a context and then you're calling some callback. That callback then calls other code. Um, in order for wrapping to properly work, the I'm sorry, in order for this to properly work, you should not need to pass the context down from your callback to the other callback. The other callback should be able to access the value uh, immediately, uh, implicitly. Because it has a reference to the context instance, it should be able to read the current value of the context instance. Um, and so there's a, a, con a context that run your code, other code. Other code should be able to access the value that I stored in the top level run. Um, if we were to have a wrap here, which is going to be necessary in order to introduce asynchronicity into our, in, into our code, um, we're going to pause at some point between the run and the other code that uh, has access to the current value via access to the async context instance. If we pause at any point in this code, and particularly if we pause in other in, in code that does not have direct access to the async context, but calls code which does have access to the async context, we need to store all async contexts. The code that does not have direct access should be able to snapshot the state and then restore the state so that when it does call code that does have access to the async context, the async context is able to get the current local value. Okay. Kevin. May I try to re uh, restate that as, so supposing that we want something that is, quote, dynamically scoped, unquote, on purpose, this is a mechanism to allow you to preserve, to maintain that scope across a sequence of turns making up a certain asynchronous operation. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, the, so wrap is actually more powerful. Wrap as exposed is uh, slightly more powerful than uh, wrap as used only by the turn spawner. So the turn spawner in JavaScript is the internal then method, which is exposed as promise.prototype as the, sorry, the internal then function, whose functionality is exposed as promise.prototype.then, the then instance method on all promises, and also exposed through the await syntax. If you don't know enough JavaScript to know what those are, just think of this as the turn spawner. Um, so uh, the then method, the the then operation, the turn spawner takes callbacks as arguments, uh, and then uh, later, uh, uh, um, when the promise is uh, settled, it calls one of those callbacks, and the implicit use of wrap to um, propagate fluid contexts across turns, uh, what it does is it internally calls wrap on the callbacks at the time that then is called, at the time that the callbacks are registered. So not at the time that the turn is spawned, this is, this is actually important, but at the time that the callbacks are registered by using then, uh, then at some later time the callback is spawned uh, and a callback is spawned 
by a top level call to the to the wrapper function, the wrapped callback at the beginning of a new turn. Uh, so that restores the temporal context, the, the, the aggregate set of all fluid bindings that were in force at the moment that the callback was registered. Okay, so getting back to our attack here, let's not read the Alice and Bob source code itself yet. Let's let's talk about um, uh, the view the view from the defender, what the defender Carol is trying to accomplish. So this is source code that uh, that Carol is going to instantiate in one compartment. Bob is source make Bob is source code that Carol is going to instantiate in a separate compartment. Uh, I should actually go ahead and rewrite this since it's all written in hardened JavaScript anyway, rewrite this using actual compartments rather than just say, imagine. Um, uh, uh, and uh, then- you just scroll down so we can see all of Carol just so that oh, we have I'm, I'm contact? About, I'm about to, yes. Um, and then, uh, okay, there, there, okay. So um, yeah, so there is all of Carol. So Carol, um, uh, so make Carol is going to be used in our test down here. Um, make Carol is um, parameterized with a secret that she's going to pass to Alice. So make Carol uh, um, uh, to make, you know, she's going to make and return this Carol object down here uh, that has two methods. Uh, log, get log and get secret. And so um, during so during make Carol, she she makes a new Alice in a fresh compartment, passing the secret in question to Alice. She makes Bob with not, without access to anything. So the only kind of and the secret, by the way, is assumed to be information. I should go ahead and constrain that so that the the, the secret is obviously information. In fact, the secret in these tests is only the variable zero and one. We're not trying to defend against possible other values for the secret. Um, the uh, and then uh, 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 we Carol makes a fresh Bob in a separate compartment, um, and then she uh, she's assuming that. Uh, the Alice object has uh, methods for Bob and from Bob, and that the Bob object has methods from Alice and for Alice and gets secret. And uh, let's not worry about what those methods are, but the Carol setup is using those methods to create connectivity between Alice and Bob that is mediated by Carol. Uh, Alice and Bob, as far as Carol knows, Alice and Bob can only communicate to each other by means that are mediated by Carol. Uh, and then having done that, uh, the, 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 these are the, the for, for Bob from Alice and for Alice from Bob are the mediating methods or the, 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 the functions the, the, that any communication, as far as Carol knows, any communication has to go through these functions. And these functions, notice that they are, have no argument and they're curly bracket with no return. So they have no, argu no argument, no arguments and no return value. They're only uh, uh, communicating by virtue of being called at all. And they, they add to this log variable uh, the record of when the, when the call started to the counterparty uh, and when the call ended and uh, likewise in the other direction. Uh, and then Carol herself is an ob is, you know, having, having done all of this introduction, then the Carol object, uh, you can ask it, okay, give me the log that's the complete record of this interaction between Alice and Bob. And also um, ask Bob what he thinks the secret is. 
So the challenge for Alice and Bob is for Alice to communicate the secret to Bob without Carol being able to tell that there was anything uh, about the communication between Alice and Bob that was dependent on the secret. And um, so here is the demonstration of the successful attack, successful under the assumptions that I stated, which is um, over here, we make Carol we make a Carol with the you, with the secret zero. We then ask Carol to ask Bob uh, what the secret is that Bob knows. Bob successfully reports that it's zero. And then we ask Carol, what's the log of interaction between Alice and Bob? And it's exactly, and the log is exactly this golden log. Then, we do exactly the same thing, except that the secret that we're asking Carol to give to Alice is one. We verify that the secret that Carol obtains from Bob is one, but the log of interaction between the two is exactly the same thing. Um, and therefore, um, uh, Alice and Bob have succeeded at communicating the secret between them by making a series of Carol mediated calls that seem independent of the secret. I don't see any hands raised, but are there any questions at this point? Is this clear? I'm not quite getting it. I'm presuming you have not yet explained how it is that this magical thing happened. Oh, okay, good. So now let's let's show how it is that Alice and Bob succeed at attacking Carol. But, but before we do that, do, do we all understand that this test case demonstrates a successful attack under the assumptions that I've stated? So the assumption that I don't quite get is you say mediated by Alice, but, mediated by Carol. Sorry, mediated by Carol, but I see Carol transfer transferring the messages without looking at them or checking to see what information is being sent. So, or is so, okay. So so now let's take a look at the. Let's still not take a look at. How, what it is, how it is that Alice and Bob are attacking, but let's take a look at what the, the mediated interaction is between Alice and Bob. Okay. Okay. So um, the, um, so uh, once again, we assume that, okay, let's, let's take a look now more closely at the protocol. We assume that Alice has a for Bob, for Bob method that it, that Carol assumes accurately in this case is a no argument method with no return result. So there's nothing communicated by arguments and there's nothing communicated uh, by the return. Uh, there, uh, let's also, um, uh, I, should have, I should have done code to do this explicitly, but let me just state there is no use of the exceptional throw channel, the difference between a successful return and throw. No use of that anywhere in this code. That would have been a means to communicate an additional bit. And that, that, that additional bit potential communication is not being used here. Um, uh, so uh, the four Bob method is no arguments, no return result. Um, and the from Bob method is takes a callback object, which um, uh, where the callback will be provided by Carol, and the callback will be a function with no arguments and no return results. So Alice's from Bob method 
should assume that she's getting a callback that has no arguments and no return results. And, and in fact, that's what she assumes when she calls it back right over there, which I will be getting to how it is that she calls it back. Uh, make Bob is symmetrical. Make Bob has a four Alice method that has no arguments and no results, has a from Alice method that takes a callback and, uh, and from Alice should assume that the callback is going to be provided by Carol and will be a function that has no arguments and no results, so should only be called under those assumptions. Uh, is all that clear? Okay, so now here's the Carol mediated connectivity, the means by which Carol introduces Alice and Bob only as mediated by Carol. And you can think of these two functions as being a degenerate membrane. So in the same sense that a membrane prevents any connectivity other than through the membrane, this is a degenerate membrane since we're from, for Bob from Alice is essentially a proxy for Alice's for Bob method. And, um, and, uh, and Carol provides that proxy to Bob using the Bob from Alice method. Likewise, for Alice from Bob is a proxy for Bob's for Alice method. And uh, Carol provides that proxy to Alice by calling Alice's from Bob method because the proxies have no arguments and no results, this can be a complete membrane in the sense of isolation because without passing any arguments or any results, there's nothing else that ever needs to be wrapped. So and then what this says is that Alice and Bob are limited to signaling to each other by making those calls, which they can each recognize, but they and they can signal different things by calling them different numbers of times, but they can't send other data other than the actual calls. That's correct. That's exactly correct according to Alice's assumptions, which are valid assumptions if Alice thinks she is in the object capability language defined by hardened JavaScript as it is today. You mean, you uh, mean Carol. Carol? You mean Who's Carol? I'm sorry. I did, I did mean Carol. I did mean Carol. Um, so what you're so so exactly what you said is correct as assumptions that that are valid for Carol to make if Carol is written in hardened JavaScript, the object capability language hardened JavaScript, as it is defined today. And then your golden test is the thing that is saying, hey, no signaling could have occurred. And then magic is the attack is still succeeding, even though everything is golden. That is correct. Bill. I think that the question uh, that might, that's most interesting to me is what does Carol have to do to protect herself against this attack? And can she do it? in a uh, in the traditional uh, language so uh, so the answer is, so um, so Justin wrote the answers to that which I will be showing momentarily uh, okay I'll uh, wait <laughs> uh, but uh, to, to to give you the high level answer on that is it is easy for Carol to defend herself there's two there's two senses uh, there, there's two coherent kinds of defense Justin wrote both of them uh, uh, but the defense must use the um, uh, the new magic. Must you the defense must use async context, which are the same primitives used by the attacker. So Carol can defend herself only by being written by by knowing that she's running an object in the enhanced object capability language. Uh, and by using the new primitives that are made available in this new object capability language. 
Well, that seems a little messy, particularly if she tries it in a, a language in a, a version that doesn't support it. Well, so and, uh, presumably she gets an exception and does something else. So, so that I mean, that's that's the the interesting thing here is that uh, if Carol thinks she's running in the unenhanced language, um, the, the hardened JavaScript without fluid scoping. Uh, and Alice and Bob are are written not knowing that they're running in the hardened JavaScript with fluid scoping, then the attack succeeds. But the attack succeeds because Carol didn't understand what language she was uh, she, um, she was running in when she wrote the defensive code. Kevin. Yeah. So I have two thoughts. Like one is that like the a subjective argument that this is in fact a terrible idea is that is just our experience in the Kaha world where we had we wrote had all sorts of you know troubles and disasters from you know oh it turns out that the browser has this magic feature that we didn't know about yeah. My second observation, which is more in the direction of this is actually okay, is just that I think in general, it's like a really fragile thing to be trying to protect some information against wall banging it out. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, you know, um, timing side channels, but in the sense of like, what, like, you, like, you, you observe that this code is not deal considering exceptions and ex but exceptions or rather the possibility of failure are can be a way to bang out a, a message by way of randomly or, or you know controlling whether you succeed or fail and just I think this is one of those things where like in this ISO in this very abstract context it looks like this is something you can do but in a sufficiently complex program it's really hard to isolate things in this particular fashion and thirdly is it even interesting to say that this information cannot be leaked in this log which you know or like relative to the viewpoint of this particular log which does not capture the question of you know was the async context wrap you know captured or not uh, I, I frankly did not understand all of that. Um, so, but let, me, but let me start by answering the part that I did understand, um, uh, which is that um, the, the, the issue of whether it is a good idea um, and, and be, the fact that you are able to make arguments both ways is actually kind of indicative of why I'm taking it to this group and why I find the whole question scary. Um, and um, uh, uh, because I can, I can argue it both ways in my head as well. Um, the, uh, the exception channel is actually answered here, which is the, if the exception channel were made use of by either party, we would not get this log. Uh, this log shows balanced uh, um, beginning of calls and end of calls. If, if an exception had been thrown through Carol, we wouldn't see this balance. We'd, we'd see it dangling um, open here uh, because the closes uh, didn't do. I didn't do this with uh, on purpose, but but fortuitously, I did not use a try finally around the call uh, around um, these nested calls. So that the law, the close log is not being done in a finally, it's just being done afterwards and would have been skipped if either of, of these things had thrown. So we actually know from the golden that, um, that it hasn't been made use of. Um, the, um, and um, uh, so Kevin, I'm just gonna ask you to re-ask uh, whatever was in your question that I have not yet answered. Okay, well, I wasn't making a, it was an observation rather than a question, but to try to restate the part that might have been confusing. Um, so 
the the exception channel is an example of how Alice or Bob can manipulate future events. And obviously you can handle exceptions. You can choose to suppress the immediate consequence on the next execution of code flow, uh, uh, the, of control flow. But what I'm saying, is, but what I'm thinking is more generally is that when you, when you write an application that has, you know, it has, you know, lots of code in it that is not, you know, this very small example, I think it generally turns out to be a case that there will be edge cases that you haven't thought of where, you know, something happens differently. And therefore, the problem set out here to make sure that nothing can happen differently is very hard. And it okay. should not be an extreme concern that doing it is that doing it correctly is difficult and you know is in so far as possible you should make the security of your application not dependent on having this kind of wall banging property okay good good uh so let me be um i am almost completely in agreement with that um uh and to, and and that's the that's part of why i'm inclined towards accepting Justin's proposal into JavaScript, proving it to TC39 and then whitelisting it in hardened JavaScript as a pervasively available um, uh, assumed powerless um, API is because writing this example, writing a, writing a successful attack was a very hard. I mean, it's not a lot of code once written, but it was very hard to figure out how to demonstrate a successful attack. Uh, and having done it, um, thinking back over all of the object capability code that I've written over essentially my entire career over many decades, um, and all of the object capability code that I've been exposed to, I cannot think of a case where where I've written code like Carol in ignorance of fluid scoping, um, where if Carol had been run in OCAPs with fluid scoping, with exactly this form of fluid scoping, this fluid scoping designed uh, with all the safety considerations that Justin has designed, um, where the difference is one that I would care about, where the difference became an attack. Um, as far as I can tell, um, all of the security assumptions made by the defensive code that I've written uh, would remain successfully defensive with regard to the issues that it cared about after the introduction of, after the hypothetical introduction of fluid scoping uh, of this form into the base language. Ke um, let's see. Um, uh, Kevin, if this is a continuation, I'll come back to you. Otherwise, I'll go to Alan. Uh, go, go ahead. It's semi-continuing. Okay, Alan. Uh, my, I have more of a meta question. Um, what is the benefit of fluid scoping? Uh, you mentioned that um, I could call someone who has no access to the variable who calls someone who does. Um, seems to me that could be achieved with sealed boxes. Is there, uh, is there something else, some other motivation? No. Um, uh, the, uh, I can answer this if you'd like. Yes, please. Um, okay. So yes, um, everything possible in fluid scoping is possible if you were to closure wrap everything. Um, my company runs a server platform uh, and one of the requirements for us is that we have to patch a well-known global API uh, to enhance it with more functionality. So the all that all code is able to directly access that global API and it's standardized across all code. Everyone knows how to call this function. We cannot change the parameters to this function or change its behavior um, uh, explicitly. It has to be done implicitly by uh, automatically. Um, in order for me to provide this enhanced API for a global function, I would need to wrap all of my users code, the people who are actually running on my platform. Uh, and it's very, very large code. It can be several megabytes. Uh, and I would then need to reevaluate their entire code base 
for every single function call. Uh, and so it's a performance benefit here. In order to do this correctly in the current system, I need to run megabytes of code every single time. Uh, in order to do it with this new capability, I don't have to do it anymore. All I have to do is provide my platform APIs. Uh, my platform APIs can directly reference these async context uh, instances. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Terry. Yeah, I'm going to be, admit to being confused by the naming here I'm, <laughs> the, of these channels that are being established. So, okay. so if we look at the API for Alice, and I assume it's symmetric with Bob. Yeah, they, they are symmetrical. Um, Those are, they, here are the two APIs. The API for for Alice is there, and it's and it has four Bob. What is that intended to do? Okay. The, uh, who's, who's intended to call that? Is that so? Is only that... only Carol will call that. Only the code running as Carol will call that directly, um, and uh, the call to that. The only call to that method is right here. Um, so Carol is so code written by Carol is calling that, but it's call I guess it, I'm 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 not understanding the semantics from the point of view of Carol's understanding of what Alice is. Uh, so Carol's understanding of what Alice is uh, is um, uh, is just that uh, she's giving Bob. The opera, over here, Bob from Alice, uh, for Bob from Alice. That's that's Me the mediated communication channel. Right. So that's so she's giving Bob the ability to signal Alice, to communicate okay. to 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 signal Alice on the control channel. To basically, right. I guess that's where the naming is confusing me. This is this is a a function to be given to Bob from Alice. <laughs> well, it's it's she's it's giving to Bob, giving Bob the ability to invoke a function, gi giving Bob the authority, not the permission, giving Bob the authority to invoke a method from Alice. So this method for Bob is a method that Alice has created. Uh, um, well, no, Carol's created. No, uh, for Bob. Well, Alice, Carol has created all of Alice, but it's the Alice code that defines and makes available on the Alice instance a for Bob method. Right. So, so Alice is intended to have Bob call that method. That's right. That's right. The okay. reason why it's called for Bob is that but Alice Carol's wrote interested it, in mediating that somehow. Right. Is that Alice wrote this method? With the intention of receiving a control signal from Bob. Okay. And so this is this is my interface for Bob. Now, what's from Bob then? From Bob means here's the authority that I'm receiving to send the signal to Bob. Uh, okay. So you can see where I'm getting these all kind of backwards. <laughs> the froms yeah. and the twos and the fours are right. So, so, so I'm going to receive as the callback here. I'm going to receive the authority to call Bob's for Alice method. Okay. And then the Bob's from Alice is Bob. That's how Bob receives the authority to call Alice's for Bob method. Right. So this is this is sort of because I'm creating Alice and Bob at the same time, I have to have a way of finishing the initialization. Well, in particular, that they're that, that you're creating them and they're completely isolated from each other. So at the point so after they're created, at this point, they're both created, but they have not been introduced to each other. They have no ability to signal right. each other. Right. Okay. And and the thing that brings about the connectivity is uh, the call, the call here on line fifty-three, and the call here on line sixty-one. That's how they get introduced to each other. Right. And if I wasn't interested in mediating these somehow, I might just give the 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 actual functions from Alice and Bob to each of the others. 
That's right. That's exactly right. Do they have and, the same? They have the same type. Maybe I. I they probably yes, have it is. The, the 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 uh, four Alice from Bob type is no arguments, no result. The four Bob the Bob for Alice method is no arguments, no result. And so basically all of the, you know, the, 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 the four, the, you know, four Bob right. and four Alice have no argument, no result. And then the, the, the other two methods on Alice and Bob are just for creating the wiring between them. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I think I'm, that's helping a little bit. It was okay. the well, names were just bugging me. <laughs> yeah. And part of what's going on, on here in JavaScript, because JavaScript is not statically typed, is if you introduce them directly, you would not be enforcing that there are no arguments and no results. If you were doing this, let's say in Joey or, or Midori and Sharp, a, sta a statically typed OCAP language, then um, uh, you could enforce the type system that all of the functions in question had no arguments and no results, although you still have to to worry about the exceptional check. Um, and then the golden here reveals kind of what the, what the trick is, which is Bob invokes Alice's for Bob method twice. And then after two invocations, two separate invocations, um, Alice then calls Bob's for Alice method once. So these are the... But, but those two facts that Bob makes two calls and Alice makes one are true in both cases, whether the secret is zero or one. That is correct. That is exactly correct. So the key is that these two calls from Bob to Alice are made in two different fluid contexts, two different temporal scoping contexts um, that, that only Bob can sense, but that Alice, even though she can't sense it, she can still manipulate it using wrap. It, it's wall banging observed using a lamp work clock. Uh, using a lamp work what? Clock. That, you know, where you have it used to have an event counter rather than an actual clock. Number of times called. Uh, I'm not sure how literally to take that, but certainly metaphorically I accept it. Uh, Kevin? Alan. Oh, yeah. yeah, I want, I want uh, to... Sorry, I... I uh, okay, you said that... You know, looking back on the OCAP code you wrote, you can't think of a case where this would have been a problem. So the, the analogy that comes to mind, uh, the situation that, you know, is when we were tr investigating the co concept of writing a sealed box in the absence of EQ. There were all sorts of programs written that mm -hmm. used the, um, right. that used, you know, call, you know, Alice calls Bob while having set a variable. Right. And some of these had, you know, some of these turn later turned out to be wrong to have attacks. And this just, you know, I think if there's, you know, if there's a problem with this proposal, it's going to be shaped like that. You know, it's going to be somebody's trying to use mm -hmm. these things. And I furthermore think that like the way in which it's the, the, the kind of situation where this is going to would come up if it comes up is essentially somebody didn't expect their scope to outlive some end condition. That is the, they, they, they mm -hmm. assumed that the fluent variable, that the value they inserted is going to, you know, live for some extent and that it would end. And like in the, in, 
I yeah. got it. I, I got it. And and you and you're right. That's that's where to look for problems. Um, uh, I have not found a problem by looking there, but I've also uh, only been living with this for for you know a week and a half now, or, so, or two weeks, or something. Uh, thinking, you know, let's say two weeks of really thinking about your heart. Um, uh, uh, Jazz, I'm I'm going actually because it is 11:40 or 42, and we're we're stopping it at noon. Or many people will leave at noon. Uh, I want to postpone taking further questions from the floor. Uh, un, uh, until I show the punchline, because I haven't gotten to my punchline yet. Is that okay, Jazz? I, I, I was going to use my question to ask you to uninterruptedly give your punchline. Ah, okay. Uh, I accept that interruption. Um, okay, so So the punchline is I have a new way of explaining the semantics of Justin's proposal that I think makes it very clear what the relationship is between the two levels of object capability language. And that is by uh, uh, imagining a source to source transformation, uh, very analogous to the way that we explain call return semantics by CPS transform. So CPS transform, call uh, continuation style transform, if you just do the transform globally, you're explaining call return semantics in terms of a language with one one way invocation. But then having done that explanation, you can then introduce primitives like call CC that cannot be written in the pre-transformed language but can be written manually in the post-transformed language to be used from the pre-transformed language. So I'm going to, to so I'm, I'm in this slide, I'm going to introduce the concept of the fluid, the FPS transform, the fluid passing style transform, um, uh, which works as follows. Rewrite every pre-FPS variable by, pretend, by prepending an underbar. I do that, and you can imagine the same, you did the same kind of thing for CPS transform or any of these uh, language to language transforms to just make it clear um, uh, what code can, can reference which variable. Um, and then for each um, pre FPS function definition, like this, th this is assumed to be a function in the pre-transformed language. If we're going to transform, uh, if this is written in the pre-transformed language, then we're going to rewrite this as the following code, which is correct source code in the post-transformed language. Um, so, uh, so, you know, all the identifiers here have been prepended with an underbar. Um, in, adi in addition, uh, for each function definition, we've added a, a parameter named f. And for each function call, we've added an argument named f. So what we're doing here is if you do nothing else other than this transform, so you're basically doing nothing else other than these first three bullets, then obviously you haven't changed anything because nothing in the pre-transformed language can be sensitive to the F. So passing the F through everything hasn't done anything. Um, but then we add to this a, a we take um, uh, Justin's primitives, and we write it in the post FPF, FPS language manually <coughs> to be available, to be invocable from the pre FPF, FPF, S, FPS language. I hadn't realized how hard that was going to be to pronounce. Um, 
uh, so that like call CC, we're making use of this lifting of, of one language into the other uh, so that the so that the pre F FPS language has additional expressiveness, even though it's rewritten to a post FPS language where the post FPS FPS language is exactly a normal object capability language. In this case, exactly the post FPS language here could be hardened JavaScript as it is today without Justin's proposal. And now, so, so all of the magic is brought about by this thing that's manually written in the, in the post-transform language, but made available to the pre-transform source code. So let's take a look at that. So and what I've done here is for all of those capital F variables, I've just numbered them so that they're all distinct variables. Uh, I didn't need to by the, by the rules of the transformation, lexical shadowing would have done everything I needed. Here. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not true. That's not true. I, I still need um, wrap, uh, still needs to distinguish them. But in any case, numbering them does not, buy, since, since we're assuming this one's manually written in the post-transform language, I didn't violate any rules by by giving them distinct names. So under bar async context, make async context is the thing that would be called by pre-transform code calling make async context. Uh, make async context has no, no parameters. So this one has an F1 parameter. This F1 is never further referenced. So this one is actu actually doesn't matter does not matter what temporal context is, um, uh, is current at the time that um, make async context is called. I should, by the way, mention this is completely non-rule breaking code by hardened JavaScript rules. There's no global state here. Um, okay. Uh, then uh, the run method there uh, takes as a first argument um, uh, some, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a, a, this first parameter that represents the fluid scope at the moment that run was called. What run then does is it constructs a new fluid scope essentially by pushing onto the, I'm sorry, each of the fluid scopes in, the, in, this, um, uh, in this form are actually represented as a function of a map. Um, and so over here, F3 is a function of a map variable. Uh, and what it will do is, um, and this is of a, a, of a map that's assumed to be at the implementation level. So it's assumed the, un, the unprefixed form of each of these globals are assumed to be uh, just globals of the um, of the, the base language, the post-transform language, uh, and because I'm writing them without underbars, I'm writing uh, I'm writing to the real primitives, not the lifted primitives. Uh, so in any case, uh, given a map, look up um, the captured key in the map. Um, uh, and if the key is in this map, then the return the value associated with that key in this map. Otherwise, uh, you pass the map down to the previous fluid scope, the fluid scope that was in force at the moment that one was called. Notice, by the way, another very peculiar thing in this rewrite is we got rid of all the try finally. So there's no try finally around this call, and there's no try finally around this call. We've got there was but try, you know there were two try finalies before. There's no try finalies anymore. Because do or do not, not, there is no try. Thank you, thank you. Yes, this is the Yoda transform. Uh, you've now named it. Um, the uh, so uh, so the things to notice here is that 
there is a transposed map created per call to make async context. In other words, transposed map, there's one of those per fluid variable. There is, the key is created as a uh, empty frozen object, which is therefore completely authority free. It, it's, it's, it has only identity. It has no ability to cause effects of any kind. The scope objects here, the fluid scope objects like F3, that's a closure that is capturing only key and the previous fluid scope F2. And therefore, the, the, and, the, and therefore this closure F3 is completely immutable and powerless given that F2 is completely immutable and powerless. So by induction, given that, given, uh, that, we're, that we only start with uh, a fluid scope representing the empty scope that is immutable and powerless, uh, all of our fluid scopes are immutable and powerless. So passing them through as the implicit first argument here cannot be communicating anything other than information. They are not communicating the ability to cause effects. So we cannot, we can no longer, so at, at the level at which we, we are doing this level lifting, we no longer at this, in this explanation, understand wrap as causing an effect, which is really key to why, to the safety, to, to the, stronger safety argument, the safety argument that, that I'm making here that's stronger than my previous safety arguments. Um, so over here, we're saying, trans, we're, we're doing the, so the binding of the fluid variable to a value is a binding that has to be uh, uh, specific to both dimensions. It's, it's specific to the temporal dimension uh, and it's specific to the fluid variable. There is one transposed map per fluid variable, and there's one key per binding event. So by setting the, um, by, by setting to the map associated with the fluid variable, a binding from this key to this value, that binding is specific to this call to run. Um, uh, and then having created this nested fluid scope uh, purely in a purely functional manner, um, by there's the, so the rewrite is really a only making use of pure functional notions in the language lift. We're now taking the nested scope and passing it to the callback. Um, and then the get method, uh, is the, um, uh, in, the, in the transform, we're passing some current fluid scope to the get method. The get method then you passes the transform that represents the current fluid variable, this fluid variable. The, the fluid variable that, that's the instance that you're doing calling get on takes the map that is specific to that variable uh, and passes it to um, uh, to the fluid scope to look up the corresponding value. Um, and that will get passed down the stack until it get, finds a binding for, the, for that key. Um, okay. So then the magic happens with wrap, and wrap is very easy to understand. Uh, the, this part over here is just boilerplate. Um, uh, the F6 variable shown over here is not otherwise used. Um, what's happening here is at the moment that we call wrap, there is some fluid scope that we're passing as the implicit extra argument in the call to wrap itself. And then when the wrapper function is called, 
the wrapper function then passes through a call to the wrapped function where the where the 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 value being passed through as the extra parameter is not the fluid scope the extra parameter of the call to the wrapper but rather the extra the the value of the extra parameter during the call to wrap and that the, the fact that this says f5 rather than f6 is the entire extent of the magic is the thing that is the reason why this lifting through the fluid passing style transformation has introduced magic it's the the thing that rap is doing that could not have been done uh, in the baseline carrot yeah I'll, I'll just observe that this is giving me flashbacks to looking at haskell state monads and and the method that, that where a state gets threaded through things without you actually seeing it it, you know, the, the state monad is, is set, well, and, and several monads are like that, where there's this behind the scenes thing that, and and in that case, get, uh, let's see, they're called get and put, I guess, in, in the state monad, they get the current state and they put a, a value into state. Those are the special functions that give you the magic okay. in that case. They, they give you access to the underlying stuff Okay. But whereas the rest of it appears mostly as as a normal functional language, you know, without you, you don't really see all of the rest of the plumbing in action. Um, so it, it, it this is just popping out at me like that. I don't know whether that helps anybody else, but I certainly, you know, the fact that you're replacing mm -hmm. F six with F five there, you know, that's changing what state we're dealing with. <laughs> you know, okay. and, and there's complete magic going on there but you know by adding this one function that manipulates the behind the scenes flow of things and uh to, to me that that helps understand it i don't know whether that helps anybody else uh it, it um it helps me a little bit um uh the the cps transform plus call cc uh is for for me the stronger analogy but i, I think i see the analogy you're making uh croc yeah, well, call CC is just plain confusing to people. And anyway, <laughs> it is probably very much closer to this, you know, but, but, you know. Oh, call CC is horribly confusing. I hate call CC. Oh, yeah, CC. it's completely confusing. <laughs> yeah. But call CC is not relying on side effects. It's, 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 it's dangerous for different reasons. Uh, so I'm going to say that that's analogous here as well. What happens is, in this, in the, in the FPS transform explanation, unlike all of the other explanations, I've avoided in making use of side effects in the ex in the explanation. Yeah, well, that's exactly what the state monad is doing. Is it's doing all of its stuff very functionally in in Haskell. I mean, it has to. Yeah. There is no mutability in mm -hmm. Haskell, and and what if you look at how state monad is is implemented, you add a an argument to the function, you know, you turn everything into a function that takes a state as its first argument. Okay. Which okay. is very much in parallel with what you're doing here, right? You know, you just, you're passing in the state as the first argument almost. Um, yep. And and so I see very, very much parallel things. I forget how the continuation monad, do you get a continuation as the first argument implicitly? I forget how it works, but it's, you know, it, it, it's similarly, you know, adds extra extra things that you get access to using call CC. Yeah. I'm going to go on to Croc. Uh, thank you. So if this can be accomplished by source rewriting, why do we need to change the language? I will let Justin take that. Um, I mean, it is currently possible to accomplish via source rewriting, but then I have to own all of the code that is going to be running and I have to transform it before I can run any of it. Um, I can't then, like, I have to own the entire program and I have to own all of the code that's going to be served by my server and everything else that could possibly happen. Um, well, that works for me. I. I would counter this then what is the point of any future language proposals javascript is essentially done i can accomplish everything through post transforms 
I, I, I strongly agree with that. I, I, don't, I don't think that's an acceptable position for the TC39 committee. I, I, I will say that my that on, on this controversy, uh, my sympathies are with Justin. Uh, Kevin. Um, so I so your, your analogy to CPS transform is like concerning in the sense that there's a sense of, you know, it's such, yes, you, you, yes, if you rewrite the language, you can make anything possible. And that doesn't mean that it's six, the original language. However, like, as you say, you know, it, it is not nearly as concerning. So the, I think a thought that I had when I was introduced, oh, yes. Mark, are you done with the material that you wanted to present? Uh, oh, should I turn off the uh, screen sharing? No, I'm asking, I am asking if you are, no. if, if we're uh, there, there, there's many so um, uh, so because of the time I'm done with um, okay. showing slides at my initiative but I'm going to keep this up in case I need the slides to answer a question okay so what I was thinking like at what I was thinking at the very beginning when you introduced rap was like if you imagine introducing this to a, a system which did not previously have it then somebody's going to be have of the opinion like you know, hey, I want, I don't do that to my variable. I want to be I want to be able to preserve the original that the 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 immediate caller value because, you know, like in particular, I'm thinking of like tracing and logging systems, which actually might act might even want might want both. That is to look at the code that you're presenting now. They want both F6 and F5. Now you can't actually do that in a clean in a clear fashion because you have to have define how do F6 and F5 get combined? Like even at a single variable that implies executing code. So it's a non-starter, but I'm just, I'm just, you know, given if this is going to be a language extension, you want to get the semantics exactly right. And I think that like for, for things that are like logging and tracing applications, it might be interesting to ask the question, is there a way to grant access to F6 in a way which is coherent and also not violating any other expected properties? Um, so in JavaScript itself, um, the what we are wrapping here is promise prototype dot then. Uh, because of the semantics of promise prototype dot then, F6 is guaranteed to be empty. Uh, F6 always uh, executes in a brand new call stack. Uh, and it's impossible for anything to be stored in the mapping in F6. Okay, okay I retract my previous remark then. I want to interrupt at this point to, uh, to, to unretract Kevin's retraction. Um, uh, Justin, uh, your answer isn't a complete answer to just to Kevin's issue because you're promoted, prom proposing that RAP itself be directly available, not just available implicitly through that. Okay. Um, yeah, so in the case where we have a public API that you can directly call dot wrap without doing a promise prototype then, uh, then yes, it is possible to have two different contexts and for the F6 context in this case to have values. Um, right. I would have to think more about how we could uh, allow access to both, but it's not yeah. currently possible. Right, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, and notice that somebody who wants, you know, who wants um, F6 but not F5 can just completely ignore this mechanism and use, you know, regular global state. Right. Okay. Um, Balder. Well, yeah. Oh, I was just going to oh. say for, uh, for the rewriting stuff there often you don't think have to own the code per se, you just have to have the rewriter, uh, be part of the loader that loads the code. That's all I was going to say. Okay, uh, Chris Hibbert. I, di I didn't get the punchline. How does Bob tell that Alice did something that oh. revealed a secret? Okay, so yeah, the, 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 there were two punchlines. I only showed one of them. The punchline I showed was uh, the explanation of Justin's proposed semantics using the FPS, the FPS transform. Let me show you the other punchline, which is how Bob succeeded at the attack. Okay. 
Okay. So what Bob does is Bob creates a fluid variable that only Bob can perceive. Uh, you know, the, Bob cannot communicate this fluid variable to Alice, so Alice doesn't has has no awareness of the fluid variable. Bob then uh, uses the fluid variable run method twice. Uh, once established calling the callback with no arguments. There's there's no args here. Calling the callback um, uh, with Bob's own fluid variable bound to zero in the in the temporal scope in which it's, it's Bob is making the callback to CB, and then doing it a second time um, uh, with the fluid binding being one, and then Bob uh, then um, and then um, Bob is making available to Alice this control signal, so that um, Alice can then call Bob back from some temporal context in which of, of out where the where which temporal context it is is of Alice's control even though Alice is ignorant of fluid bar uh, and within the temporal context determined by Alice Bob then uh, reads the fluid variable uh, and stores it in his secret variable so that when Carol asks Bob, what secret did you learn from Alice? Bob can, can report the variable that he stored in secret. Alice, um, when each time she gets called by Bob, she has this snapshots list. So each time she gets called by Bob, she pushes onto the snapshots list a wrapping of a function from a callback to calling the callback. Um, so in other words, uh, 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 each element of snapshot is um, a function of one argument, which is a callback argument, uh, and it's then going to wrap the callback at the time you know, and well, sorry, it's, it's a callback. It's a function of a callback argument, but it's one that has captured the fluid scope at the moment that it was pushed onto the snapshots list. So the so the the snapshot sub zero is one that has captured the temporal context, the te the fluid scope. Sorry, interrupt. Mm -hmm. Quick. Um, the person who is recording is about to leave. So if we want anything recorded, you have to do it very quickly. Okay. Uh, uh, in which the, the fluid context in which Bob's fluid variable happens to be bound to zero. And then the um, uh, snapshots of one is the one in which Bob's fluid variable happens to be bound to one. And then um, when, um, and then, uh, the callback that Carol gives to Alice that gives Alice the authority to, um, to invoke Bob's for Alice method with no arguments uh, uses the wrapped callback calling function that she stored in snapshots, looks up that function according to the secret, restoring uh, that captured temporal context and then calls callback with no arguments in the restored fluid context. And uh, Jess, let's see how far we can get before Mike has to leave. Uh, is the, uh, are we replacing Justin's difficult problem uh, by making it Carol's difficult problem here by forcing her to do the set of transformations? I did not follow yes. entirely. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, yeah we're, we're saying that an innocent Carol, a Carol that thinks she's programming in an unenhanced language is subject to this attack. So if this is an attack she cares about, which I'm further claiming is almost completely, is, is extremely obscure, is that I cannot think of any realist, any actual example that I've ever encountered in which Carol would care about the attack. 
But if Carol does care about the attack and she's, she thinks she's, being, she's writing code that would be correctly defensive in the unenhanced language, then she's written code that is vulnerable to the attack in the enhanced language. So we've moved the burden from Justin's users, the, the ones that want to use fluid coping, move the burden to Carol. Uh, and, 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 the, and the transformation for Carol, I mean, so it's certainly a smaller load in that we only need to transform a, a smaller set of users. Uh, is that transformation any different from the transformation we would need to do? Like no, my sympathy is... No, 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 yeah. the, the, the transform, we're assuming that all code written by users, all code written by users in the FPS explanation, all of that code is transformed that the only thing untransformed is the implementation of the fluid scoping mechanism itself. Uh, so let me show you, uh, Justin wrote uh, two defenses for Carol to use. So one defense is that Carol can make use, Carol herself can make use of fluid scoping, I won't show how, to be able to detect a difference between these two logs and and thereby mediate in, in an in an aware way so that Carol can see the difference. That's one defense. And the other defense is that Carol can make use of uh, the fluid scoping so that uh, in order to censor the communication so that no secret can be leaked. Uh, um, and both of these, uh, you know, uh, both of these are general defenses. Uh, Carol, uh, knowing the, she, that she's re, being written in the enhanced language, can use fluid scoping wrap to engage in either of these defenses according to what Carol is interested in defending. Uh, Jazz, was that clear before I go on to Kevin? It is. Okay, Kevin. Okay, so um, the the defense, uh, the the sensor defense, as you call it, is also you can also be implemented in the frame of of you know run the other party in another in their own turn so that they can't ever observe the lack of wrapping, and this is also a defense against you know many other things which we lump into the bucket of plan interference. So I think that, so I think that's a useful argument towards. You know this is okay because you like the, you likely have other hazards if you are invoking untrusted code if you are invoking you know you know a party you are suspicious of you know in response to being called by another party you know and That's including right. like denial of service is the obvious one but you know there's a, a, other possible considerations from that and so if you run in a new turn then you have none of these problems not even this new one we're proposing introducing yeah, uh, Justin. I wanted to add a couple of uh, points. Um, can you highlight line 62 through 64? Um, so this is one of the defenses that I wrote, uh, and this is the entire extent of the defense. Um, in order for Carol to ensure that Bob and Alice cannot communicate, um, actually there's line 52 and 54, I'm sorry. Uh, so there's two parts to this defense. Um, she can force their communication to happen in a context that she controls. Um, and so it's a, what literally if you were to delete line 52, 54, 62 and 64, that was the original code. And the new code is just adding those four lines in and then she's completely defended against uh, the attack. Right. Um, other defense, which uh, Mark showed before, but it's not currently being shown, uh, is similar amount of code. Uh, it's four extra lines and some uh, setup that happens. Um, and it's extremely easy for Carol to defend against uh, in order to prevent this communication from happening without her knowledge or for it to happen at all. Um, the second point that I want to highlight is that this attack does not leak an object reference. And so you can't use it to gain more capabilities. You can only use it to leak a single bit and you can do it multiple times to make bytes or whatever you want. So you can pass a message, but that message does not carry any capability. The, yeah, the, the, that is by the way, why I used the, the transposed map, which made the rewrite a little bit more complicated 
than it needed to be just to be a rewrite. I re used the transpose map so that all of the Fs that were being passed had were completely powerless and transitively immutable. Uh, and that kind of establishes that the extra communication here is not communicating uh, even through an ignorant Carol, is not communicating anything more than information. Uh, Kevin. Sorry, I've got to go. I'm stopping okay. recording Mike, now. Mike, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, and that brings I'll us put it on Google Drive or something. Bye. Okay, great.